to welcome you here. Today is a very special event. Uh, this is the first time we've brought together all of the network groups uh, that the DVRC is involved in, and so it's pretty special. Many of you have asked about this. You said, is there a way that we can network with the other network group members? And it finally, we finally were able to get that to happen, and, uh, and today's the day. We also were uh, kind of gifted with a very beautiful day, and we, we have 20 golfers who are planning on and hanging around and, and playing golf. And uh, so it should be a, a beautiful day. Maybe a little soggy out in the golf course, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but this morning, we're really pr uh, proud to have uh, Dr. Steven Spinelli with us as our keynote speaker. Uh, we are then, after that, we're going to have a little bit of a uh, go around and every one of us is going to stand up and kind of give your name and a little short uh, you know, description of your company. We ask you to keep that within a minute because we want to try and get through all the players that are going to be here. Then we're going to have table topics um, to give you, a, you know, kind of a chance to, to mix it up with some other players other than just your normal CEO forum or, or council group. So you're going to be able to get to see some of the personalities around the table and how you solve problems, and, and, it'll be a, and then we're going to have a report out. So you have a table captain at each of your table. Um, then we're going to have, after the table topics, the networking, and then for those of you who wish to stay for lunch, and then finally we also have those uh, golf event later today. Um, but anyhow, the thing that I wanted to, we have some guests here today as well, some individual, individuals who are considering joining the group, so we, uh, just for their benefit, we want to share with them that basically what the DVRC is all about. And the DVRC is an economic development group, and our focus is strictly in the manufacturing sector. And we try to do and provide services with consulting, the network groups, education, uh, which is like our Institute of World Class Manufacturing, and of course STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math component of talent development, which we consider very important as far as the feed of of skilled talent into the manufacturing sector. So that's really kind of our, our main drivers of what we're trying to do. Uh, today's event is going to be focused on innovation and growth and leadership. And we're going to be spending some time in that. Our table topics will be geared around that. And what it's all about is trying to help us continue to explore the art of growing the value of a business. And it is an art, special, and all of us have different ways that we go about it. We have best practices that we have to go out and try and spur that value of the business. That's what we're all charged with. <coughs> and today, uh, Dr. Spinelli is going to talk uh, about that with us, and he has a great experience. I'm going to read his bio in a moment. But really, growing the business value is what it's all about. And we need to understand that. We need to explore that. So your table topics will be geared that way. Dr. Spinelli is going to be talking around those, those items as well and uh, it should be a very, very uh, enjoyable and worthwhile morning. Let me give you a little uh, introduction for, for Stephen. Uh, Stephen and I had a great chance with Mark. We were getting prepared for the event today, and we pulled up his bio, and, and uh, I have to say it's, it's, it's very impressive. But let me, let me go through it. Uh, Dr. Spinelli served as Vice Provost uh, for Entrepreneur, let me just make sure, for Entrepreneurship and Global Management at Babson College and created Babson's MBA course in franchising. Prior to this, Dr. Spinelli co-founded Jiffy Lube International in 1979. He is founder of American Oil Change Corporation, Jiffy Lube, and served as its chairman. Dr. Spinelli served as director of Ben Franklin Technology, or serves as director of Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Southeastern PA. He serves as director at the National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship. Dr. Smilly has researched, written, and lectured extensively in various aspects of entrepreneurship. His work has appeared in publications such as the Journal of Business Venturing and Frontiers of Entrepreneurship and featured in the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Boston Globe, The Entrepreneur, and Inc. Magazine. He has authored numerous uh, business cases and is the co-author of New Venture Creation for the 21st Century, Franchising, Pathway to Wealth, Creation, uh, Business Plans for the 21st Century, and How to Raise Capital. His newest book is Franchising, Pathway to Wealth Creation. He taught at Babson College in Wesley, uh, Wes Wellesley, Massachusetts, where he currently serves as director of the Arthur M. Blank Center for Entrepreneurship and chair of the Entrepreneurship Division. He has been a member of the Babson College faculty since 1993. Uh, Dr. Spinelli graduated from McDaniel College, now Western Maryland College, in 1977 with a BA in economics he earned his MBA from Babson in 1991 and his PhD in economics 
from the University of London's Imperial College. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Spinelli. Uh, and by the way, I just want to mention really, his current role right now is he is uh, president of Philadelphia University, okay, uh, and has been there since 19, 2007. Dr. Spinelli, welcome. Uh, I'm the most miked person in America. Hi, everybody. Um, it, is a, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I have a, a theory that there are three kinds of people in the world. People who wear suits and people who have substance, and then there's a rare breed that can do both. Unfortunately, I'm not the rare breed, but I did talk to this gentleman back there, and I think he qualifies as a rare breed that can do both. The rest of you clearly have substance, and I'm here to entertain. The reality of this speaking engagement is fun for me because you're kindred spirits. Uh, oftentimes, I'm speaking to groups who question either what does entrepreneurship mean or is there any value in entrepreneurship. What I'm going to do today is talk, I'm not going to convince you there's, there's value in entrepreneurship. Um, that would be, I think, preaching to the choir. What I'm going to do is break this into three sort of pieces. Reflect on entrepreneurship and what the entrepreneurial imperative is from the beginning and how it might affect your operation now. And what I mean by leadership for entrepreneurs. And it's different than other applications. So what I mean as leadership for entrepreneurs. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am uh, and, and why entrepreneurship is important to me as, as a little bit of that. And then I'm going to go briefly into some work that I've been doing over the last three or four years on value creation, especially in the segments you might be in. And we've done a lot of work and a lot of research, and I work with some companies, one in particular that buys small and medium enterprises and looks for particular uh, uh, characteristics of those enterprises when they're buying them. It is a proxy for value creation. So what are the things that have happened over the last, and I've gone back into their data set and I've been working with them for the last four years on what they're currently buying. Uh, acquired probably 14 or 15 companies over that time. Varying sizes from $2 million company to a $400 million company. So it's been really varied. Um, and while I'll show you what I think the perfect deal is, there's, we've never had one. Uh, you know, there is no such thing as a perfect deal. <laughs> But, but I'll show you what we would see as, as a perfect deal. And then I'm going to do a brief ad for Philadelphia University and what we're trying to do. And it would be fun for me to get a bit of a sanity check and see if you think I'm being entrepreneurial there or not. I mean, it, it, it is a fun role for me to move into, to sort of put my money where my mouth is. I've been an entrepreneur and I've been a teacher. I understand it's harder to be an entrepreneur. You, I've been on both sides of that. I sleep better when I'm teaching. I make a lot more money when I'm entrepreneuring, but I know it's a lot harder to be an entrepreneur than it is to be a teacher, and, and, and I have a great deal of respect for what you do. Now let's see if I can make this actually work. May I ask you to help? Sure. Put, this is, this is uh, we have a very special high-tech approach to this. Would you hold that in front of the speaker <laughs> and see if, the, if we can make this work? Sure. At Suburban, you'll find revolutionary ideas that other dealerships just don't offer. <laughs> Suburban Auto Group on Highway 26 in Sandy. Trunk bucket pending approval by Attorney General. Right, back in the trunk. And that's the part I like the best. That's a really important part. At the NEC, he says, get yeah, back in the trunk. <laughs> Yeah, I love, I love, thank you very much. Okay, See if we can get back to the, uh, thank you, that's perfect. See, the, the, I could really, is this on? Is this on? Okay. Um, I could really title this the trunk monkey video. I don't want you to get back in the trunk. I think the entrepreneurs are the trunk monkeys. And historically, we're the ones that when all the things go wrong, when we need a fix about something, when there's really an important thing to do, who do you call? 
Call the entrepreneur and he'll get out. They'll figure out a new business plan. They'll find a new company. They'll solve the problem and then get the hell back in the trunk. Don't get in the trunk. If, if, <laughs> if I say nothing else, grab your crowbar and start driving. And I think that it's an imperative. I think that we're, we're at a point in uh, economic development that you, we don't have any choice as an economy. It is either be entrepreneurial or fail. And I'm not just talking to those. It's more fun talking to you because you get it, frankly. I mean, or you wouldn't have these companies. But there are a lot of big companies that really don't get it. And frankly, there's really a lot of students that don't get it. And it's hard to break through. But I'm going to try. Now, one of the things I've done, it's been a lot of fun uh, being at Philadelphia University. There's about 60% of our students are in design-related fields. And, and they think that you have to have pictures to describe everything. So I'm learning. And I am learning a lot from them. Um, I'm reshaping some of my thinking about how I approach the companies I work with because of what I've learned from the design students. It's been really fabulous. I would <coughs> recommend that some of you, that, that you go to uh, tagsito.com and copy your uh, CV, your resume, and put it into Tagsito. There's a little box you can put it in, and a picture will come out. And it analyzes everything and it puts it into a picture. Now, I took my, now academics tend to get a little weird about CV, so you've got to have long ones. It's, it's a quantity thing. So I've got like 18 pages of CV. I put all of that into it, and what word <laughs> comes out in a startling way? That at some level, for most groups, that, that's, a, that's a big red flag that says, I see the entire world, I see all of goodness occurring through the entrepreneurial lens. I am a fanatic about it. Everything I do, everything I see, I think is the font of all goodness in that is entrepreneurship. Now, I understand there is a dark side <coughs> to entrepreneurship. For me, the dark side of entrepreneurship is hubris. I can do anything, the world needs to follow me. I've seen that too. And understanding that I try not to be like that and I ask entrepreneurs to at least understand both sides of that personality. But it is a dominant player in what I do and how I see life. I did a lot of study, and in the study, this had, really did have a dramatic impact on how I see things. I like to study, and I like to write, and I like to think about things. But I learned more about action and about value creation through the companies I've worked with. I've either started or invested in or serve on the board of a lot of companies. These are some of the fun ones. Um, these are, this is a, a former student nextworth.com, you should go on and buy a lot of stuff from him. I, I'm, disclaimer, I am an investor in the company too. Um, well Pet is a fantastic company that does gourmet pet food um, and growing you know, like crazy. Planet Fitness, I don't know if you know about it. Elmer's an iconic old brand that we're trying to bring back and do some special things with. And it all, for me, all started with Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube was an interesting company because it, I was at what was then Western Maryland College, now McDaniel College, and I played football there. It was a Division III uh, school. I was the toughest guy in the world. I just wasn't very fast or very talented, but I'd hit anybody anytime as hard as I could. Um, and the coach thought that was good. Not particularly talented, but, but good, and it might, be, it might serve me in business. He was a retired entrepreneur. He retired at about 35 and went into coaching. He was a retired entrepreneur, and he said, after a couple of years, let's bring together some of these guys that can hit hard. Because there, there's no future in football for them, but Hitting hard is maybe not a bad thing. So let's bring them together and let's do something. This was an amazing imperative he gave us. Let's do something that changes the way America does something. Let's create a business that changes Ameri the way America does something. Now, I was 23. Oh, man, I was just the most excited guy in the world. I'm you know, he says, you know, could you go through that door? I'm knocking down the whole wall. I mean, that's just about as exciting as you can get. And I didn't have any money. So what was I going to lose? That was, you know, it was all his money. And there were four of us that went off, and we, we actually found Jiffy Lube. We were going, you know how serendipity is a big part of this whole shtick? We, we went out to, it was 1979, and there's a number of people in this room who remember 1979, and there was a gas crisis, and gas got up to $2 uh, in 1979, and it was going to be a big crisis, and... We were talking about energy and energy efficiency and all of that cool stuff. And there was a windmill company out in Ogden, Utah. So we were going to go out there and we are going to do windmills. 
I, I always thought Don Quixote would have been a great logo for this group. We go out there, it doesn't work, and we find a company, while we're out there, we see a company called Jiffy Loop. And we see this store and this sign over, and there's a bunch of cars lined up. Anybody been to Ogden, Utah? Really? God bless you. You're, there's like three people in the world that have ever been to Ogden. There's more deer in Ogden, Utah than people. Lovely town. It, it, it really is. You <laughs> most that's right. At least most of you, you're right. <laughs> Needless to say, there aren't a lot of cars there. So we see all these cars lined up in front of this thing called the Jiffy Loop. So we didn't have anything else to do. The deal was going south quick. Uh, so we stopped in and said, why are all these cars here? And the guy says, uh, are you from the East Coast? And we said, yeah. He said, I could tell because you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, you know, it was, a, it was a good sign of our maturity. We said, okay, well, inform us. And, and they said they're here to get their oil changed. We, and there's no such thing as these fast oils in anywhere. This was the first one. And we said, um, wh why all these cars? Why are they lined up in the street? And he said, it's like that every day. Oh, <laughs> oh baby. In Ogden, Utah? <laughs> what happens in Philly? <laughs> Where they really have cars. And that was... I got, <laughs> I got my PhD in entrepreneurship, really, I moved out to Utah, I was, I was the youngest of the group that he had recruited, so I moved out to Utah and I became a great oil changer. I really did become a lube tech and I, and I tell students to this day, you got to learn how to change oil. Some of them get it, some of them don't get it, but you know, lefty loosey, righty tighty, I learned all the lessons and I became a good lube tech. But understanding the nature of the business and how to communicate that to the rest of people is really important. I'm teaching, I te I'm teaching a design course this semester, scared to death about it. I should be scared to death. I should be on an edge. I should be learning all the time. I've written a number of books, a um, couple more than are even on there. I forgot the franchising book, my latest one. I should have had that on there, you know, because deep down I'm a retailer, so I want you to buy stuff. <laughs> I can't help myself. My wife would say that I actually wrote one book and published it five or six times with different <laughs> covers, but um, but it, I, it, it's been a lot of fun doing this. And there was, it does tune up one's mind. The, the quickest way to learn something is to teach it. It's amazing how that gets, gets one prepared. I like to think that all of this led me to Philadelphia University, which is really a, a, a hidden gem. I've got to unhide it. It's not good to be a hidden gem when you're trying to enroll people. But it really is a hidden gem with a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and a real connection to to industry, and at the end of this discussion, we'll talk about, very briefly, some of the things that I'm doing and get your critique of that. Does it make sense? Am I really being entrepreneurial or am I fooling myself? <coughs> I think it's important to define entrepreneurship. I, I have found it to be one of the most abused words in the English language. It's also one of the most abused words in the French language. Something tells me you knew that. You look very, because you have the suit on too, you're very sophisticated. <laughs> uh, entrepreneurship means to build in, in French, but it is a terribly abused word here. What do most people think entrepreneurship is? I, and I'll tell you what, especially corporate leaders. I don't know if any of you ever came out of a big business where you had to deal with uh, you know, a billion plus or two billion plus or three billion plus business and what leaders thought entrepreneurship was. What do you think? See, I'm the professor in me comes out and I have to ask a question. Remembering that my principal objective today is to have fun. And so if it's at your expense, I'm willing to sacrifice you <laughs> for that. <laughs> what do you think? It, there's no wrong, no right answer because your opinion's as good as mine or anyone else's. What do you think corporate folks think entrepreneurship means? Yes, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Hmm. <laughs> no, no. Hmm. It's not a criticism. Hmm. As I'm thinking. <laughs> yes. The trappings of success. Ah. The trappings of success. Interesting. A lot of them, yeah, yeah, a lot of them really do think of it as small business. What, anything else? Yeah. New product. Huh. See, I love talking to these guys, mostly guys. God bless you, you are a courageous woman. I <laughs> 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 Start recruiting, man, come on. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's really interesting to me. What I have found, and I, I've given these talks, and I've had some executive uh, work at BAPS. I used to do, I used to try to teach undergraduates, MBAs, and execs. Undergraduates would run through a wall. MBAs are incredibly analytical and meticulous about things. And execs want it real. So if I could teach all three, I could be enthusiastic, be detailed, and keep it real. I, I didn't always get there, but what I found from large companies that uh, uh, thought of what they thought of entrepreneurship was esprit de corps. And that meant, I want you to do what you're doing. I want you to do what I tell you to do with enthusiasm. Yes, sir, I can do that. That's what they thought of entrepreneurship. I'm not sure. I am sure that most of you have a good sense of what you believe entrepreneurship is. The question is, does your organization? And as the older you get, and I don't mean personally, chronologically, I mean the, the older the company gets, and sometimes the more successful the company gets, the farther from their roots and their understanding of what the entrepreneurial spirit really is in your company. And leader, part of leadership, for me, is constantly reinforcing the message of what, why we're here. What does this mean? If you don't do it, it will atrophy. I guarantee it. There's very few guarantees in life. But I can guarantee if you don't reinforce what the basis of your company is, what the mentality and the spirit of it is, it will atrophy. It will cost you a lot of money and a lot of heartache because of it. Now, some of the words I have here, a way of thinking and acting that is opportunity obsessed, holistic in nature, and leadership balanced. Important, again, you're talking to the fanatic and you know a little bit about my history, thinking and acting. Thought without action is frivolous. When I say that in front of academics is when they usually leave or turn me off. I don't care. You can ponder your navel all you want. You can write a thousand books. I don't care. Is it motivating something to happen? Action without thought is dangerous. I am fully, I fully believe in that initial qualifier. Thought and action is what entrepreneurs do best. They like to pretend they're going to jump off the cliff and figure out how to get down in the air. Most of them aren't like that. Most of them leap off the cliff, they have a parachute, they might have a hand glider and there's some safety net under there, and they have figured out, and then they go back and write the book and say, well, I jumped off and I didn't know if I'd hit the bottom or not. It's not true. Entrepreneurs think deeply, act decisively. About what? The nature of opportunity. And not only opportunity, but their opportunity. I, I love telling this story. I wrote this definition and with a co-author who's a, just a genius and a wonderful guy. Uh, was one of the founders of the uh, cellular phone industry. And, and a PhD from Harvard and just a genius. A guy named Jeff Timmons. He's since passed, but I think about him every day. I, I, when we wrote this, I sent it to my sister, who was a brilliant writer and a psychologist. The psychologist is an important piece of this because she read it and she said, it's well written, it's understandable, it gets to the point, but the obsessed word bothers me. As a psychologist, obsessed is a pathology. That means you're sick. I said, oh good, that's, that's the word I want. Yeah, that's the way you, you're, you're sick of it. You're always thinking about it. You can't stop. You can't turn it off. Is your organization like that? Does your organization know, understand the nature of your opportunity? Will they think deeply and act decisively about it? And are, are they obsessed with it? Maybe. I'm asking you to do a gut check on that and to look at your organization and have a discussion with them about it. Holistic in nature is an interesting one. And it's particularly problematic, I'll talk about this later, in higher education. But I see it in a lot of companies. The larger you get, the more siloed you get. This is your job. This is your job. This is your job. Deeper, deeper, deeper. I understand that. But they're going to lose sight of what the objectives are. They're going to think their objective is getting their task done, not building the kind of wealth that you're looking for or seeking the opportunity that you seek. So, Keeping those blinders as wide as you can, and I understand nobody sees everything. I'm not asking for people to be perfect, but I'm asking you to open them up, and I think there's ways to do that. We can talk about that later. And leadership balance is a fun one for me, because there's a lot of meetings. The first one being, 
What is the nature of this organization, the mission of this organization, why are we entrepreneurial, and why is that important? What is the nature of the, of the opportunity that we are seeking and are you opportunity obsessed and what are you thinking and acting on to make that opportunity real? That is persistently your job as a leader to do. I'm going to talk about a model or a balanced model that I'm, I'm going to hope you'll get into too. And why do we do it? Here's where, where many groups who are not in business would criticize me for the purpose of value creation and capture. That's when they usually say, the academics usually say, I knew it was about being a greedy bastard. <laughs> At least you've uncovered yourself now, you son of a gun. I would ask you to do a couple things. I think this is really an important part of it. And it'll be fascinating to go through this with trusted people in your organization. Ask them two questions. What is value and for whom? You're going to get some really interesting answers. Now, when I'm teaching this, or if I'm working with someone who's creating a business, I ask the same questions. And they say, well, we're going to create value for me, my partners, my investors. What people like you usually start with is customers, vendors, investors, employees, partners, shareholders. And the interesting part of it, that, that gives for whom? Then you get down to really specifics. I mean, in a Jiffy Lube, we're creating vendors. Pennzoil, the, the sales department. Frank Turner, the vice president for sales. And when you start to understand what Frank Turner values, and how he defines value, it's going to have an impact on how you act. And in my opinion, it pushes up the probability of success, and it pushes down the, the risk that you'll, you'll face in it. There's no perfect deal again. So it's a, it's a balance of risk and return. The reality of it is, if I'm being really honest in, a, in front of this group, I really, I'm always honest, but I'll be frank. I want all the return. I want none of the risk. I, I would love that deal. Why do you think people buy uh, lottery tickets? The risk is a buck. The return is $163 million. Not really, they cheat you on that. But anyway, a lot. <laughs> And, and they're thinking, I can get all the return without any risk. Well, that's cool. Well, that almost never happens. So you start to have to have, find some balance in that. What is value and for whom? You'll have fun, by the way, really. And you can get very specific. Well, it's, it's financial return. Well, well, how much? Well, it'll be fascinating to see the differences. Now, <coughs> part of your leadership responsibility, and it's, leadership is a part of this model, model that we created with Jeff Timmons. You'll, you'll note that there's a little lack of comfort in this model. What most people want to do is get feet firmly on the ground and they can hold something up here where we have them standing on a ball holding things like this. Much more tenuous position to be in. Much more real. I understand how hard it is. It was fun just listening to you as walking around. How are sales? Well, the if I got it right, uh, March through October is our busy time, then it's our slow time after that. We get ready for that. I don't know why it's slow, but I'm working on that. I wish I could have 12 consecutive months, but boy, we're busting our butt now. Well, I got a 14-week pipeline. I mean, you're balancing like crazy. You're intense as can be. I love this stuff. The, the problem that most people face is they turn it on their head and they have team and resources on the bottom. So they're looking for the resources first. Resources follow opportunity. That's why discussing the nature and extent and obsessing about the nature of your opportunity is so important in the organization. You can't keep that balance without really focusing on opportunity. Opportunity, the size and shape of opportunity dictates the size and shape of the other two, not the other way around. If you put Bill Gates on a startup Software, I, I bet it'd fail. Be fun for him to see this. Hey, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be too, the, the, the team circle would be just huge and, it, and the other parts would fall over. Your job is to try to keep that balanced. Now, you'll note, what I like to say is, all of this around, this is the world, this is the universe, and all around it is threats and forces and competition, and they're trying to get in and, and knock your deal over. And sometimes they get in, and there's fits and there's gaps. And identifying what the strengths and the weaknesses are of your plan is a constant job of being a great entrepreneur. 
and you could call this your plan, your concept, your one year forward. You could do all kinds, of, you can call anything you want, but I think you get the point. How do we get these lines as close to solid as possible? Understanding we'll never get a perfect deal. Leadership, communication, and creativity. We'll talk a bit, little bit more about that as we go along. But you are the leader of that model. I think the perfect entrepreneurial organization, people walk around with that in their mind, in the forefront of their mind. How balanced is this model? What is the nature of the opportunity? Has that dictated the team and the resources, and do I have that balance? What are the fits and what are the gaps in that model, and what am I doing to strengthen it? Imagine if every employee said that every day, all the time. In my practical life, this is what I have found. A good idea that's looking for a business model. The people that can figure out what the business model is. Everybody, it's, it's really fun. You could first day, go into the first day of a class, go off to Wharton and go to their best class and say, anybody have a good idea? Is it a good business? What's the business model? What action have you taken? They'll sit down. <laughs> it, everybody has great ideas. The, the question is, is it really an opportunity? And do you have the creativity, the problem-solving skills to put it into a business model that, has, that is durable? And examining the nature of your business model, do I understand what the opportunity is? Do I understand the nature of the business model? And am I trying to improve that all the time? Do my employees know that? Do my partners and I agree on that? Do my stakeholders understand that? It's an interesting way to stay entrepreneurial. What I try to do when people say they have a great idea, a quick vet of it, and you, and you get rid of about 80% of the questions, maybe even 90% of the questions, the 10% that come back are more interesting to talk to. What's the nature of market demand? What's the market? It's really four Rams. I've been criticized, by the way. But I've decided you can't get famous in academia with even numbers. I don't know why. The seven deadly sins. It's got to be odd numbers. So I said, okay, I'm going to make it an odd number. We'll put two together. I can do this. I can solve this problem. Market demand, market size and structure. How big is it? Who, what's the nature of market demand? How many are there? Who's currently serving them? Will they pay me for this? Ask those questions, idea to opportunity, get rid of 90% of the bad ideas. And in my, that's in my academic <coughs> analysis. And, and again, I, it's hard for me to separate the academic, the thought, and the action in, in my practical experience. In my practical experience, I talk about really looking at the nature of opportunity and shaping it. Figuring out where the market demand is, how can I build margin, what is competitive, all of that. What I found in real life is that great entrepreneurs make the stumble part of the dance. Nobody's perfect and everybody makes a lot of mistakes. And, and, and I've stopped using the phrase trial and error. I don't think entrepreneurs see it that way. This isn't me, this is what I've seen in the world of people like you. It's trial and evaluation. Sometimes it works, a little bit of it works, a little bit of it doesn't work, maybe it worked better than I thought, maybe not quite as good as I thought. But when you start talking to your organization about trial and evaluation, you s it, it changes the perspective. I've been amazed at this. People don't, aren't as frivolous with trial and evaluation as they are with trial and error. I don't like errors. I'm really willing to put up with good effort that has an evaluation that is going to improve us. I'm not sure that's an error at all when you put it in that context. Especially if it makes us better down the road. Okay, I got it. Keep trying, man. This is great. Trying an error says it's okay to fail. Now, I fail a lot. Failure is an option. I think you're nuts if you don't think it's an option. Inaction, lack of evaluation, lack of real effort, that's not an option. We can narrow that. Make the stumble part of the dance. Some of the characteristics, and here's what I, I love to tell this to students, here's a, especially the young students. But in your organization, and, and you, at a lot of levels, entrepreneurship is very personal. It's one of the reasons I like teaching it. It is about people. It's always about people. What the hell are we here for? It's always about people. So are you entrepreneurial? Start asking some questions. 
And I never tell people, I, I ask students to look at this, I never tell them to share it with me. What is it that you've done over the last year that would make people describe you as that? Well, Mark Basla, he really has a tolerance for ambiguity. He handled this situation where there were 14 different options and boy, he did a really good job of clearing through all that ambiguity and we found the opportunity. Willingness to grow. Ray Kroc, who knows Ray Kroc? Every year a few fewer hands go up on that. It's really interesting. Founder of McDonald's. Uh, green and growing or ripe and rotting? Very clear. Entrepreneur, if entrepreneurship is about opportunity and you're seeking opportunity, you will naturally be a more growing organization. Growth is an essential part of this. Now, I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money without growing. I got it. But the model says the, better the, the more I'm growing, the more money I'm going to make, the better chance I have for a capital gain and real success in the business. Green and growing or ripe and rotting. Ask yourselves, by the way, there's a little hidden message here. Ask yourself to these questions. What have I done in the following, in the, in the previous year that would have my organization or my stakeholders, those people who I'm creating value for, how, what have I done that would make them describe me in this way? You'll find gaps, I guarantee it. And so you say, when you hit an, a, a situation that you face that maybe can get you more tuned to this, you might take some more chances. Here's what I have found. For organizations that grow and create real value, the entrepreneur knows how to play well in, team, in teams. We oftentimes get these personas and these rock star things going on. That's fun and I think that's great, but it's always a team that creates the, the real scale and the real durable value and the saleability of that value. One of the things we don't do is buy a company where the entrepreneur has all the vested knowledge in them. I can't really buy you. We can take a chance on you, but I gotta see that there's a team that can execute this or the value of the company goes down. Plays well in teams. This is an interesting one for me, and these, these are all, for me, dramatic impact on education. And in a lot of ways, frankly, you're all educators. At some point in entrepreneurship, it is about educating the team to get this game won. So you become coaches. Finding problems. Most people solve problems that are given to them. 95% of the people, and we train you that way in colleges and universities, by the way, throughout your education. What is one and one? Two. Correct. Three. Wrong. Next problem. Here's, what is the formula for, and I'll ask a couple of those questions. What is the formula for X, Y, Z? Right or wrong? What entrepreneurs do is they find problems. We could do that. Did you notice that we could do that better? They find problems. And typically, even, and, and I find this fascinating, I'll talk to entrepreneurs. Now, I've done, I've written 30 or so business cases, or pretty in-depth cases about the entrepreneurial process, usually focusing, focusing on the entrepreneur as the protagonist. And I've interviewed 250 or 300 entrepreneurs from startups to <laughs> mega billionaires. And they all say, I had this idea and I stayed with it like a laser beam. Never have they done that. Never, not once. You get into the, and I don't contradict them because I don't want them mad and leaving. But what I, what I find is, they say, well, we were going here and then we saw this and we pivoted here. And we had laid out these four things, so I knew, I knew they'd be there. Well, they'd done all their homework to know they'd be there. So they could, they started to see, well, we're going to follow the river because that's where the water is and there's no mountains and it'll go through the, and they really understood the map. And all this nimbleness and instinct that we attribute to entrepreneurship is a problem-solving technique or characteristic. They map it out so when they get to a problem, they see where the pivot points are. I find it absolutely fascinating. I could map that out for 200 or 300 entrepreneurs that I've talked to, that I've interviewed, about how they look at the, how they map the solutions and they pivot at key points. Play well in teams, find problems, map solutions. They've got to be reasonably smart, like something above room temperature to be an entrepreneur. You have to have some affinity for people, probably more than IQ. 
P2Q? This is where this is a trick question. That's one of them. Perseverance, persistence. Second one? No, nope, that's in the E, but thank you. No? Nope. Well, although that's a really, I could do a three on that one. Perspiration. I mean, they really do work. They don't just focus, they really work hard. And I think as you go along that, it gets more important. It might be 10%, 20%, 70%, 70%, the formula for success. Now, this is really the hard question, but again, given the IQ here, should not be a big deal. Anybody a chemist? Because I'm not convinced I have this right, but if there's no chemist here, I'll, I'll say it's absolutely perfect. <laughs> oh, you guys are you guys are good. You're the only group that even came close to this. <laughs> But now he's irritated because he doesn't have it exactly. Th this is the best I could find for the formula for stomach acid. <laughs> I'm not sure it's exactly right, but it's the best I could find for, st uh, for stomach acid. So it's intelligence quotient, emotional quotients, persistence and perspiration modified by stomach lining. And how much, how much tolerance you have for the acid swirling around in your gut. There is no one that I've ever met. People have different widths, and I, I could do a predictor on, some of, on the width of someone's stomach lining, but, but let me tell you, it has an effect, and everybody has stomach lining issues. All right, now, who knows who that is? is it, who said that? I, I love you. <laughs> <coughs> and why is he famous? Besides, he works at Philip University. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I don't really do that. I'm going to go hug you. <laughs> this is cause I'm going to have to restrain myself here. <laughs> he's also the winningest basketball coach in the history of men's NCAA basketball, which is just a thrill, and he's a terrific guy. So I'm, I thought in sort of honor of Herb, we would do a little video. Now, can't talk. Have to be completely quiet. There's no sound on this. Or it's not good enough. Um, so it doesn't, it's, it's okay. If you really pay attention, and it'll have written words, it'll give you instruction, focus like crazy, and answer the question at the end. But you really have to focus. Hope I get this right. Oh! Slightly concerned. This is a test of selective ah. attention. It worked well, but... Uh, Count how many times the oh. players oh. Ah, ah, ah. the basketball. No, we're going to go back. Can we go back? How do I do that? Here, help me. <laughs> God bless you, man. Thank you. I should have known one of you guys were going to be able to do this. Uh, and then do it as a, uh, a widescreen. Okay, can't ask any questions. You, now you've got a hint, but... I didn't the first time. <laughs> now I can't see anything but the damn gorilla. <laughs> okay. Christopher Chabry and his copyright. It is available for use in. Now I would say. <laughs> I'm 
giving away all my little. Did it work? Yeah. Keeping your organization focused is a double edged sword. Now, I got to tell you, about how many people saw the gorilla? Wow, more than you. About 50% of the people, or it's more like 60% of the people, never see the gorilla. Not, not on the first try. Now, if you ever watch this again, all you'll see is the gorilla. I mean, it's just, just so obvious. But about 50% of the people don't see the gorilla. I make no judgment whether that's good or bad, neither do the authors of this. But it is about asking the right questions and getting people to focus on the right things. Did we say, you know, keep your eyes open for special problems that might occur or special circumstances that might lead to an opportunity? Or did we say focus like crazy, like I did, and count 50? I got 15, by the way. Those of you who got 14, I know which one you missed because I've done this so many times. I, I, I got it. We were told, <laughs> we were told to count the, the, the basketball passes. We weren't told to look for other opportunities in this. And it's really, really, if you can miss the gorilla, could you miss something your customer needs or something that happened in the marketplace? It's really interesting. Now, I believe that persistence is fueled by belief in the mission, and the mission is around entrepreneurship and is particular to your com company. I will tell you, and I have a particular issue here that I, it doesn't bother me if we have a capital gain here. I think that oftentimes is one of the advantages of, of capitalism and of entrepreneurship is that there's a, there's a touchdown to be gained in this game that we can carry the ball and we can bump into people and sometimes we score a touchdown and it feels good and we win the game. And we have a pretty good measure of that. I like saying that I'm at Philadelphia University as president, I'm working harder than I've ever worked without the prospect of a capital gain. There, there is an interesting issue there. Now for me, I have to define value in some different ways. And I have to constantly <laughs> remind myself of what is it you're trying to do and how do you define value. Now, I want to focus just real quickly on this insight problems versus creativity. Too many people think of creativity as the source of real value. I think what I've seen in, in entrepreneurs is they have insight into what the nature of the problem is. They find the problems and they build them into business models. That's very different than creativity and typically the difference really results in value creation from, uh, from solving insight problems versus just creativity. And managing that can be very difficult. Lessons that I see breached often. You do one or the other. I don't like canes in particular, but I like this specifically. Remembering the roots. How, if I'm an entrepreneur, I've been doing this for a long time. Remembering your roots is opportunity uh, obsessed and value creating. Is there thought and action everything you do in your organization does? Do you understand the definition of stakeholder value? Does your organization, do the individuals within your organization? Can you look at insight problems and shape your business model to solve them? And are you willing to continually do that? The organizations that remain entrepreneurial go through this process. Now I'm going to go very quickly through this. Can we have a time check so I don't get too cared of? Okay. We'll be done certainly in five or ten minutes, less than ten. An analysis of, so I wanted to bring some more specific value to the table. And so I looked at the data set that we had and um, some of the things that we found. And again, macro trends, key acquisition criteria in identified sectors. Now, the key acquisition criteria for me is probably the most important part because that says if I build my company to look like this, I can get acquired for a lot of money. And everybody exits their deal, by the way. We sell it. We die. We, if somebody inherits it, we give it to, to our kids. Something happens. You're going to exit the deal unless you've figured out the fountain of youth. You're going you're gonna to exit the deal. So thinking about that is not a bad thing. Some of the macro trends that we use that says, what is the, the larger lens that allow us to start to focus on industries that uh, we think are going to create value over the long term? And typically the, the acquisition is a 10 to 20 year hold from, for this organization in particular that I'm working with. The key acquisition criteria, and, and 
the plus part is, is your organization and what are you doing to make that plus? So is there a reasonable expectation that it'll be GDP plus? And the bigger the plus, the higher the multiple. And I think this is a fun one because uh, uh, some entrepreneurs have said to me, well, if I've got enough cash flow to self fund everything, including CapEx, I ain't selling the damn thing. <laughs> I'm gonna just keep riding this. That's okay. But when you wanna sell it, you're gonna have a whole lot of value there. And this is an interesting one. Is there a potential that you become a platform for which bolt-ons can occur? Both organic growth and, and bolt-ons. Again, all of that speaks to a higher multiple. And of course, I love an EBITDA of around 20% or better. I'm not convinced that you have to be global in the markets. That is contra, counterintuitive for a lot of current thinking. Um, but I think you have to show an ability to grow in a more diverse geographic or, or demographic um, uh, background or, or customer base. If you show that you can grow and that you can reach uh, diverse customers, then your multiple goes up. If it's international, it probably goes up higher if, if, you're, if you've done it effectively. I'd rather be effective in the United States than ineffective internationally. Some sectors that uh, we've looked at with uh, special interest because we think they follow the macro trends and then we look for the individual company specifics within it. And that's that. I, I might put this on your website or give it to you so that if, if people wanted to look, especially at that part, um, they, might, they might spend more time and be happy to talk to anybody about it and why those numbers became important or those uh, characteristics became important. Then I want to t talk to you for the last couple of minutes about Philadelphia University and what I'm trying to do. It is 120, I call it a 126 year old startup. There are very few people in the world that understand what I mean by that. So I go in and I see this incredibly entrepreneurial set of pods going on. All these little components of entrepreneurship, but they've sort of lost their way about who they were. They're Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science. And there's still a huge, I mean there's one building full of, of machines that, that look like they were built somewhere in 1823. I mean, it was just wild. And, but then there were incredibly interesting things that they're doing in science for the government in, in uniform, 21st century uniform development. So there's this bizarre kind of contradictions going on there. So I go back to my theory of entrepreneurship and the seven steps to becoming more entrepreneurial. And you go through a process and say, what is what is the nature of this opportunity? How do we shape it? How do we bring a brand to it? How do we do all those things that I've said today I think you ought to be doing? We settled upon the thinking. I, this is important because I do see both sides of, I, I, it's really important for me to, to reiterate this. The entrepreneurial spirit, the opportunity focus, the action orientation, and the hubris and arrogance. And so I, I get sanity checks. I try for sanity checks just to make sure that I'm not being arrogant about what we're trying to do. It's a 125, 126-year-old company. We've got, it's about a $300 million physical plant. Um, it's, the enrollments are doing great. And here I'm saying, I've got to change it. I, you know, I've got to make sure I'm doing the right thing. There's a lot of history and a lot of future that I am intimately concerned with doing the right thing for. So we looked at three components. We have a very heavy design component, a burgeoning and really interesting engineering component, and a solid, if vanilla, business component in, in the model. There's other pieces of it, but this we saw real interesting value in. And what we said was, what we see in higher education is they come in with this sort of broad view, you get these broad concepts, and over four years we narrow them as much as we can their coursework, their view of knowledge, their specializations, and then, then we graduate them. <coughs> what we find is that a lot of schools, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Stanford, might as well shoot for the best, um, have brought in these collaborative courses to try to fill in some of the gaps. And they're very cool courses and we've, with their permission, we've copied a lot of their thinking, we've invited them into campus, we've gone and visited them at their campuses. Brilliant, brilliant people who have done amazing things in very large institutions. We think we have a competitive advantage because we're small. 
So how do we be small but, but act larger? Fill those gaps. So we said we're going to create a college of design, engineering, and commerce. And we're going to have a series of courses to fill those gaps. They're going to have to play well in teams. They're going to have to learn how to find problems. They're going to have to map solutions through their disciplinary lens and in a team effort uh, come to some conclusions. Here's why we think that gives them a competitive advantage. When they first get out of school, the first five years they, they do task-oriented things typically, especially the engineers, frankly, but the designers and a lot of the business kids. Then, if they want to grow, they have to broaden out. You can't just do the books, or you can't just do structural testing. And then, if they really want to be into leadership, they have to be broad and strategic. So they go from task to tactical management to strategic leadership. So if we can fill in those gaps, we think we can save them a lot. Why not, a lot of years, why not teach them to be interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, rather than teaching them to be in silos and then hoping the business will break them of that habit over a 20-year career. Seems counterintuitive to us. So we've put that together, and we've integrated the three. We think that what we are finding is that when we give them real-world problems in this curriculum, innovation emerges. It is fascinating to see the kinds of solutions. So unique products and services in business models that are desirable, feasible, and viable. So first, we think that we've created the first curricular structure to teach innovation in a holistic way. I could talk about that for several years. I have. <laughs> I hope you'll hear from me in different times and places about this curriculum, about Philadelphia University. I am uh, desperately interested in your success uh, because I think it has a direct relationship to my success and the success of this economy. Um, I'm most appreciative of Barry, you're, you're giving me the chance to uh, speak here and to meet these fine folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephen, we have, uh, we're, we're delighted to have you here. And we have a small token of our appreciation for your being here with us today. It's not a pen. No, it's not a pen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to. It's something, gonna, something you can probably enjoy at dinner tonight. Oh, thank you. I, I will. Stephen, thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you.